Succession Season 2 is somehow both more hilarious, absurd, satirical, completely over the top and outrageous, and also so much more intense, dramatic, and just full on. The balance between the nail-biting tension and drama and just the real kind of serious intense stuff and then the absolutely absurd hilarious side of the show is just incredible. They balance it so well. It's honestly a miracle of TV. This is now becoming one of my favorite things I've ever seen and um, once again like in season one I'm like people keep talking about this succession. They're like Drop everything you're holding, Jax. You love TV. Watch Succession. You'll love it. And I'm like, I'll get to it. I'll get to it. I got to it. It's the best. And now I, I can't stop watching. I love it so much. Season one was amazing. And season two is even better. I love how different this season feels. Yet it feels so organic the way it's grown from season one. And the real big difference is Ken. In the first season, it really felt like it was Ken versus dad, Logan. And they were sparring and going against each other. And there was such a kind of a volatile feeling to the family dynamic. And everyone played their part in it, but it really felt like their story. And particularly Ken's story. And this season, even though his first season was an ensemble, this season feels so much more like an ensemble. And I think that's because Ken kind of takes this interesting back state. Like, he feels so different. He's like a wounded animal. He's so broken. Even just the tone of his voice is just so different now. After he's horrifically, accidentally murdered a boy due to his drugness and just all that horrible stuff that ended season one and then kind of falling back under his dad's thumb after the whole season trying to fight and battle against him and he's suddenly now part of the family and the aspect that I really loved in this season compared to season one that feels so organic and natural is that season one was so angsty and it was so intense with the family they all just they all hate each other and I was like oh I just wish they could hug and be friends again and now they kind of are like early on in the season Shiv gets rid of her political subplot and she joins the family and Logan's like you'll be the next successor you'll be the successor you're the succession you're the title of the show now and on top of that when he reveals in the first episode I'm like oh that's why the opening titles all the families there it's instead of just little boy Ken and his father they're all there because it's now a proper ensemble and I felt like Shiv your little girl Shiv she got kind of more of a bit of play. We see more of her with the pony. We see more of her looking at her dad. And I was kind of like, this is really cool. I kind of wonder if each season is going to focus on a different family member more so. And it kind of felt like it was definitely going to lead that way with maybe Roman in season three. But who knows after that crazy cliffhanger. I love when a show embraces a huge big moment and it doesn't shy away from it kind of changing and completely making our main character feel different. Like Ken is just so fundamentally different after this big horrible moment like he doesn't kind of just shake it off. I love how in this season Ken is completely different. He's so broken down. He's like a wounded little animal, a wounded pup, now with his father and he's always kind of by his side like giving his father advice, always siding with his father and it's such a different dynamic than season one but it feels so justified, so well earned throughout what happened at the end of season one, the way it's kind of folded in and then throughout the season you kind of get this sense that they are growing closer together again. And you know, maybe it is water under the bridge. And he starts to kind of see his father in the way that maybe he saw him years before when he aspired to be him. He found him awe inspiring and he loves his dad and less of that kind of intense baggage that kind of built up and you know piled over in season one leading to all the betrayals. And then you start getting to the end of the season and Ken is finally kind of embracing the fact that he's got a, you know, deal with this. Like he's got to kind of embrace the fact that he is going to be picked to be thrown out, uh, hung up to dry, hung out to dry, whatever you want to call it. But he's, he's the one they've pushed out into the center to be like this big scandal that kind of takes up most of the season, this big, big scandal, it's going to be Ken. And the way Ken kind of goes, I'm getting punished and I deserve to be punished because of what happened to me, because it, it all gets covered up. There's no kind of mystery of, Ooh, will it come out? There's none of that. And I really enjoyed how the character suddenly feels like he's at this place to be like, I can accept this. I kind of deserve this. I didn't do this, but I've done something way worse. I'm going to take this. And that moment where he said to the press conference, I'm just like, oh, this season is going to end with him and he's going to be gone. Maybe he'll go to prison. Maybe he'll be a barely in the show. And he's gone from main ensemble, maybe a guest appearance in season three. And I just... I found it so emotionally satisfying and interesting and such a great arc. The characters had such a great arc over the two seasons. And then he drops the craziest bombshell. I, I was screaming. I just couldn't believe it. Just holy moly. Oh, 
Holy moly, guacamole. I couldn't handle it. It was so outrageously intense. It was such a moment of just like, wait, what the hell? Why is he doing this? And then suddenly realizing, oh wait, Jax, you idiot. What was the premise of season one? Ken versus father. And season two was just a little, a little interlude. It wasn't them reconciling. It was him having to be under his father's thumb because of the whole, the whole murder thing. But now he's come out and he's like, oh, dad, you, you're going to pick me? You're not going to pick Frank or with some, you know, Tom with a little bit of Greg sprinkles? None of them? You're picking me? No. No, dad, bad. And it's just a big press conference. And he's like, my father was behind all us. Bah, bah, bah. And then suddenly that voice, that acting, that tone, suddenly season one, Ken was back. It was so intense. It was so glorious. I genuinely could not have guessed that would happen. I found... It's so compelling and such an interesting kind of reshaping how I viewed his whole arc of this season and the way that he wasn't actually reconnecting back with his father, but he was being repressed by his father and it's still all under there. It's all under there simmering. I am so glad that we did get a season with all the family kind of together, happy being like, I mean, as happy as they are, the Roy's are pretty messed up, but like as happy as they were kind of together. I love seeing him and his dad kind of being, you know, together and not being like, I don't know, antagonistic, but now in hindsight, knowing that's kind of one chapter of the story in which they are, you know, always sparring, is then going to make season three so much more satisfying and so much more intense because they almost got close. And then Ken has just torn it all to the ground. He's burnt it down. Just honestly crazy. Like, I don't know what he's thinking. It's so intense. I cannot believe he's dogged his dad so hard and kind of just turned against the family. I'm super curious if anyone in the family is going to kind of come back and side with him. At points throughout the finale, it kind of felt like maybe Tom was going to kind of oust himself, not get done for it, because as they said, he's not a big enough fish. But I feel like maybe if he sided with Ken and we kind of split the teams up, and I guess Greg would just follow Tom, because they're just the dynamic duo, the absolute comic gold of this series. I absolutely adore every single scene with Tom and Greg. They are exceptional. Tom. Tom is exceptional. I love the character. I love the actor. He has this kind of goofy charm that I just can't help but kind of be on his side. When Shiv was cheating on him, hated it. Hated the character. Love that we didn't get any of that this season, except for, because I guess they're in the open relationship, um, which I always kind of felt like, ah, Tom didn't really feel like he was wanting to do that. And then the big bombshell at the end of the season where he's like, nah, I hate this. Open marriage on my wedding night. What is this? Exactly, Shiv. What the hell is that? Outrageous timing, Shiv. Outrageous timing! One of the best aspects of season one and season two as well is just putting these characters that they somehow make us love and adore. Or maybe I'm crazy. Maybe I'm the only one that's like, I love these guys. But you know, it's just such a interesting thing. It's it's kind of the Breaking Bad syndrome, I, I call it. I'm dubbing that now. Or the more, more specifically, the Walter White like situation. It's a character who in the real world is the worst man who ever lived. But like, because I'm following his story and it's so situated in his point of view and I'm so kind of tied to what he's doing and the filmmaking and the writing and the acting is just so spectacular, I can't help just be kind of like, I'm on his side. I want to see how crazy this gets. And it's kind of the beauty of this kind of intense anti-hero, but these aren't anti-heroes. These are just villains. These guys are awful. Uh, storytelling. And HBO is the king of that. They're like, we're going to write the worst man who ever lived and make you absolutely love him. We're going to have Tom destroy all these, you know, destroy evidence and all this stuff and be an absolute scumbag. And if you saw that on the news, you'd be like, that guy sucks. Well, we're going to make you absolutely terrified in season two. Just terrified and sad and heartbroken of the fact that he might go down for it. How are they doing it? Or have I lost my mind? Am I insane? Am I on the wrong side of this? Who knows? A subplot that I really, really enjoyed was Roman and Jerry. And they're like, will they, won't they, wait, will they? Are, are they going to have sex? That's awesome. Like, I don't know. It was just like a really fun kind of little subplot to kind of play along. And kind of, I don't know, Roman started getting this really different side to him this season where he's still that kind of scumbag piece of shit, you know, smart ass kind of funny guy and no one takes him seriously but then he starts kind of doing little deals here and there and i particularly liked when he came back from the terrorist situation and they were all like oh jerky jerky it's all funny comedy stuff and he's just like oh, that's not funny guys i thought i was gonna die and then suddenly i'm like oh my god i love this he's getting that he's getting the ken makeover he's gonna have like this character shift due to this big thing happening and this show can be so farcical and ridiculous and absurd and silly with the, like, the satirical kind of take on it and all that so heightened and extreme 
But then it really handles situations and like, it's all like really well kind of crafted in the character development department. And I find that really fascinating. The way that they're able to kind of have these larger than life, completely piece of shit, rich snobs. And then they start getting really kind of, kind of into what makes them tick. And it's all so family orientated. And I find that so fascinating. The absolute highlight of the season is the big boat yacht sequence where they're all sitting around the table and every single character just looks at each other and they're all pointing the finger, throwing other people under the bus while trying to put themselves on top of the bus or driving the bus or whatever metaphor you want. And the way this all plays out is so funny, but it's so dramatic and amazing. And it once again highlights just how exceptional the writing and acting is in this series. They're able to be so, so funny and satirical and over the top and ridiculous, but there's so much true drama and emotion behind it. And you feel pathos for characters that are horrific and you laugh at them like the next scene. It's just exceptional. And this is definitely the highlight of the show. This episode, the final episode of season two, magnificent. And it's so great that the show is just getting better and better and better. Little side note, I love that they essentially picked every single person. And I was like, the only person that hasn't been kind of grilled by someone is Ken. Oh no, it's going to be Ken. Oh no, Ken's going to... It doesn't matter, Ken's a sneaky betrayal turncoat. The whole final episode, the whole time I'm like, it really... Like, this whole season can, like, kind of rests on this choice they make. Like, who are they going to pick and why? And, like, I don't know. I felt like a lot kind of rested on this big, big moment. And then I felt like it was such a satisfying kind of choice. And then the crazy twist. But then when you think about it, like, of course, it's bringing it all the way back around. And I love that, like, he's kind of been under his thumb due to this kind of big thing. They covered up the murder. But then they can't kind of throw that back against him. Because they covered it up as well. That's going to throw them under the bus. And like, there's one thing where it's like, oh, we've all been partisan to some some murder stuff uh, that other people have done 20 years ago or whatever on a boat. But uh, the fact that his son, while on drugs, killed someone and they covered it up, that is so much bigger, so much crazier. I'm terrified that that's going to come out this season. And it's going to be yeah, really interesting to see kind of it kind of fall back into its, its roots, its original kind of premise of, Son is like, I want to be the biggest, richest man in the world. And his dad's like, you suck. You're not good enough. I also, oh, oh, I also just suddenly realized maybe the reason, maybe he was falling back under his dad's thumb. And maybe he was kind of loving being part of the family again. And then maybe it was that moment where he's like, Papa, Daddy, right at the end. I've said I'm going to do it. It's all going to be good. Do you reckon I could have done it though? The big job. His dad doesn't even, at first he's like, do what? Would you do what? Prick. Dad, you know exactly what he's talking about. Logan, you maniac prick. What are you doing? And he's just like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Oh. You're not a killer. And by that, he means a metaphorical killer because literally he's a killer. But he's like, you're not a killer. You don't have that killer instinct. And maybe that snapped and that got at him. And then he's like, I will be a killer. I'll be a political megalomaniac, businessman, businessy killer by killing you, my dad! Oh my God, he's gone Macbeth or Hamlet or whatever Shakespeare play. Someone kills their dad. I, I don't know. I, oh, my brother will be pissed. I don't know that. And another little tiny detail that I noticed that I thought was just amazing. And maybe I'm overreading it, but I think I'm totally kind of, you know, understanding what the scene kind of implying is when Ken's doing the thing. And he's all like, my dad's the worst. Blah, blah, blah. I've, got, I've got the killer instincts and I'm going to kill my dad. Blah, blah, blah. Metaphorically. Blah, blah, blah. And he does the whole thing. Everyone's like, oh, oh. And then Logan's like, oh, he didn't do that horrendous smile I just did. But he does, because, you know, he's a good actor and not a maniac yelling at uh, camera in his room but that little subtle smile from logan was like it was like he's respecting his son for the first time potentially like he's finally like huh my son who can do all the business do all the things except he doesn't have that killer instinct that you need to be a businessman that killer instinct that this maniac man needs from his you know successor and then maybe by turning on him he's shown he truly does have that killer instinct and he's finally uh you know respects his son he finally has a new appreciation for his son and it just i don't know that little detail that little acting kind of moment exceptional stuff like such a confused damaged insane man to have that kind of response like visceral response like a like a smirk of kind of acknowledgement and like kind of respect for his son betraying him just Mwah. one of the more interesting aspects of season one was kind of just the general premise of like this big old aging you know 
the warlord, uh, but uh, oh, yeah, some people, some people refer to him as Hitler. I think it's his brother in this season. Uh, absolutely uh, <laughs> intense. Where you're like, I don't how they're making me care. It's just Brian Cox's performance. He's just so good. It's just such a captivating, interesting performance. He's so, oh, he's good. But he in season one, he's like. I'm getting old. Like, the season starts. Like, the first scene of the show is him pissing all over a room, but like, where am I? Where am I? And he's, like, totally lost. It's super weird and kind of, like, you know, it's sad when you realize what's happening. But then it's like, oh, okay, well, the whole family's like, he can't do this. He's an old man, and his faculties are disappearing. That is, like, essentially... Well, not essentially. It is entirely dropped in season two. Season two is like, yeah, we're not, we're not doing that anymore. Like, I feel like... It, well, the start of the premise of the idea was like, now it'll set everything off. And then, you know, we'll just kind of drop it until our final season. Whichever season we choose to be our final season, it'll kind of creep up right at the end of like the penultimate season. And then the final season will him being pissing everyone and being like, actually, I am 80 again, rather than being the youngest 80 year old man who's ever lived. There are scenes where he's doing stuff and I'm just kind of like, that's right. He's meant to be 80. I had to Google it. Brian Cox is 75. He looks 50. How is he 75? How is he 75? He's fitter than I am. I don't understand it. It blew my mind. He is the youngest 75-year-old man I've ever seen. I've ever seen. Like, it's it's exceptional. And, yeah. But, yeah, I don't know. I just found that a really interesting kind of little thing to be like, oh, they've totally dropped it. Like, there isn't a single scene this season where he's like, uh, and he loses, you know, like, just no little hint at it whatsoever, whereas almost all of season one, they're like, oh, God, if he opens his mouth and says one little thing, he could spout anything, and the, the whole thing will be over. And I guess they're focusing on different things. The family's coming back together. But, yeah, I just found that interesting. I wonder if that is going to be brought up at all again, or if they will literally just saving it for the final season. I feel like almost every single show has this, where they kind of like set one thing up, and there's, you know, they've got all these plates spinning, like I'm spinning all these plates, but there's kind of like this central plate that's kind of like the end game plate, and they're just spinning it. And then they're like, yeah, but like, we can't really just keep spinning it in front of you the whole time, because uh, it's too big and it's too like end gamey. So, you know, oh, it's, it's still there, but you can't see it. And then the final season comes in and they're like, whoa, remember like season one, the central premise, he's getting dementia or something, or he's just old. I, I, I can't even remember because season two doesn't mention it once. Okay. So I'm getting to the end of my review and I'm suddenly realizing, I think I forgot to mention the fourth brother, Con, again. Um, he's good. He's really funny. He wants to be president this time. I love the performance. Cameron from Ferris Bueller, but he's old now. He's got a beard. I love him. I love the fact there's a character in it who's like, I don't want to be part of the business side of this. I don't want to be a part of this. I find his kind of girlfriend that's like an escort, but he's kind of like tricked himself in his mind that she's not an escort. It's a little cringe. Like just for him, I just feel like really bad. I feel like he's kind of forcing her into it and she's kind of overwhelmed by the money. So she's saying yes. It's a bit, I, I, yeah, it's a bit like, ooh, <laughs> it's a bit icky. I kind of get that. That's the point. We're not meant to be like, hey, look at that cool, cool guy. But yeah, something about it just kind of doesn't jive. Yeah, I don't know. He's fine. Like, he's good. I think he's a needed component. I like that there's one son, like one sibling, you know, one child of the big, big Logan, Papa Logan, that's like, you know, I don't want to be a part of this or anything. And I really love that Shiv kind of comes into it and there's three of them are all fighting each other like siblings do, you know, fighting for their father's affection. And yeah, that's really the heart of the show is everyone fighting for their father's affection, but they kind of hate their dad, but they love him. And it's just... It's classic family stuff. Everyone's got a daddy issue. Ba -ba -ba, all that stuff. One reveal, or I guess it's a reveal. I don't know. It's just kind of a moment that happens. That felt like a reveal to me. I could have just been not paying attention probably in season one, but I really kind of digged how hilarious and ridiculous, but also kind of horrific and just like sinking in that these guys, even though I'm really kind of, you know, I'm falling in love with them as characters, you know, in this show, in this setting where, you know, the bar is set where like everyone's awful, but it's encapsulated in this awful world. So who's least awful, you know? It's like the Game of Thrones thing. Everyone sucks, who sucks least? And you know, and it's the dynamics change in the world they're setting it in. But it was the Mo Lester kind of reveal. Cause I feel like he kept being like, oh Mo, we all love Mo. Oh Mo, my best old buddy Mo. And then to have that reveal where he's like, you call him Mo 300 million times, but you never call him Mo to his face. Is that because his last name is Lester? And I'm like, I don't get it. And he's like, get it? Mo Lester? And I'm like, I don't get... Oh. 
oh boy, oh boy. And Tom's like, <laughs> and I'm like bursting out with laughter with like that horrified kind of laughter of just like, oh man, they know they knew he was a molester, but they, they just, they just, they just called him that they didn't stop him. And that, that felt painful and real and intense but like so ridiculous and such a silly like name. And it kind of felt like a reveal because it was like, we've heard Mo a bunch. I don't feel like he wasn't on screen. I don't think, but we've seen, we've like, he's a character in the show. And to have that twist reveal that that's his like nickname because of that. I don't know. I feel like that encapsulates everything that's working about the show where it can be so dramatic and intense and horrible. And it's such a murky universe that these guys are all playing in. But it's so funny at times. Like, I don't know. It, yeah, it really kind of stood out to me. This whole season, it's amazing. The show is spectacular. The acting is phenomenal. I'm loving all of it. It is so, 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 so good. Uh, two thumbs up for season two of Succession. Thanks for watching, guys. Like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and comment below. I'd love to know what people think of Succession season two.